Tom Lowerman, known to most of us as Farmer Tom, is an organic farmer, social activist, surfer, and a leader in cannabis normalization. In 1999, his legal collective, Medical Marijuana Garden, was raided, which set him on a path of speaking out and speaking up for cannabis patients everywhere. Farmer Tom first got my attention as a legit organic food farmer, growing beets, broccoli, cucumbers, chard, tomatoes, onions, among other food crops, and bringing them to the Clark County Fair in 2015. His food crops won 17 blue ribbons and a Judge's Choice Award. I soon heard about his CSA for cannabis, and it blew my mind. You know, for those of you who weren't here in the early days of Vimeo, that's why Vimeo was started, was to promote cannabis on the island as a way to save our organic family farms on the island. The idea at that point, before we saw the regulations, was that we wanted to support farmers in adding cannabis to their crops to take some of the pricing pressure off of the food, to just let be food and less of a commodity. I heard about Tom CSA and I'm like, damn, he's doing the ideal of what, the whole reason I started my organization. Unfortunately, over time, we know that that's not allowed anymore in Washington, which is a drag. But for a while, he was living the dream of what I started Vimeo for. Tom has since diversified his interests, co-branding a craft beer with Heathen Brewing in Vancouver, Washington, called Farmer Tom's Super Dank IPA. <laughs> and for those of you who care about such things, it's got an ABV of 9.3. Yeah! yeah. <laughs> we got and on that note, we give Tom extra credit for driving the three hours up here from the Portland-Vancouver border to speak with us tonight. Centers for Disease Control has been to his farm to study cannabis best practices and has asked for his help in writing a safety manual for the medical cannabis industry. He also looks like Canna Santa. <laughs> <laughs> Almost everything that I think is cool and important, Tom has done before me. Please welcome Tom Lawrence. Yeah. Yeah. Chicken skin down here, you know. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I, well, you got to see all so many filmy unfamiliar faces out here. So many people that I've known and worked with over the years. It's exciting to have everybody here, and it's an honor to be on this stage. So many of my idols have been up here. It was kind of blew my mind when he asked me to be up here. So this is pretty much an honor, huge honor for me. So thanks for showing up. And uh, a little bit about me. Um, I was born and raised in San Diego. I'm going to just go right in through my agriculture stuff. I started uh, landscaping at age 12. My neighbor had a landscape construction company, so I started planting plants and ground cover at a really young age. And uh, so that kind of got me into agriculture and growing plants and vegetables and cannabis and everything. We have a, an organic sustainable farm down in Vancouver where we grow our vegetables and our cannabis the same way. Everything gets the same process, you know, we are, we're big foliar feeders, we're big in the living soil, we use lots of microbes and we feed the microbes and, you know, we have our pretty simple process and, you know, so I'm just going to kind of take it up from when I kind of start, I started thinking about harvesting, it's like at the end of July and uh, so I want to keep my plants growing every day. So what I do is I go in every day to each plant and I, and I take four big leaves off the main stock and not to shock it, so I want to keep it growing. So every day, so this is for the small grower who's got time to love and nurture their plants. This is pretty much the way that I do it. Um, I've never read any books about you know growing cannabis, and you know I'm really not that you know school worthy of cannabis. I've just been doing it a long time. I just kind of ran with what I knew, being a landscaper my whole life. So I've always kind of bragged about my holes because one of my big pits usually cost me about 20 bucks. And that's with nutrients and uh, compost and everything. So I'm, I've always been a pretty thrifty guy and being in agriculture, that's what you kind of got to do the best you can. So um, so what I like to do in July is I start to like get in there, either one, one bigger branch on the inside or two or four leaves or two uh, like uh, stems on the inside. And I go through all the plants 
every day and I try to just take a little bit and a little bit and a little bit off so they keep control growing. And what that does is it opens up the inside of the plant so it can breathe. You know, being on the west side of the Cascades, we get a lot of moisture, we get a lot of humidity, and it all gets caught up in those plants. That's where most of the powdery mildew starts. On the opposite side, like on the, you get a powdery mildew on like the north side a lot. The, the uh, northeast side especially, it's really prevalent. That's kind of where it starts and it grows from because that's the shadiest spot on the plant. So we like to clean out all of that, that dark side, that north side. We, we like to clean that out a lot. And it also promotes ventilation. Where we live, we're pretty blessed with, uh, we, we have really nice winds where we live. So we live off the Columbia River and every day at like three o'clock, we get these nice breezes and they blow through until about 10 o'clock at night and they're really nice. So I always keep those sides of the greenhouse open. It makes for a nice ventilation and it keeps the plants nice and healthy. I like to plant right into the ground. I think there's a good energy spirit when the plants do a little bit better if they're actually in the ground. Um, I've actually heard of people that grow in pots but actually ground their plants off, you know, to the earth. So there's a, there's some there's some you know we're we're big on uh, uh, feeding the soil and we're really huge on uh, microbes and uh, minerals. Remineralizing the soil, we use uh, SCA90, which is a sea sea product out of Baja. It comes out of Scammon's Lagoon twice a year. They have a, a salt plant down there, and it floods over. And once they take the salt out, it's just a mineral base. So we've been using this for, for years. It really is a lot of life and it really brings minerals back into the finished product. And we always thought in agriculture that was always the missing thing. So we use a lot of rock dust and sea solids in there. And the rock dust we use is Gaia's Green and it's out of Canada. And the reason we use that one is because it has the lowest salt content. A lot of the, uh, a lot of the rock dust out there have pretty high salt contents and this one has the lowest by far. So as we get into uh, this time of the year, it's a race, you know. Uh, we, uh, the weather's come and we've got rain already and the moisture's up and we already, our buds already got wet. So I'm sure that people are starting to see bud rot and stuff like that. So it's key right now to start, you know, harvesting as quick as possible. You know, what I'm usually looking for um, when to first start harvesting is, is we, we try to wait as long as we can. In this industry, and we've been doing it a while, it, the, the whole deal was, was if you didn't have a little powdery or a little blight, you didn't wait long enough. So then, <laughs> you kind of hair it out and went, shh. Right. Which sometimes isn't a bad idea because that stuff can really spread quick. And if you don't have much time and you work in a regular job, you got to get it while you get it. The first sign, take it down. Especially this time of year, don't try to cut it out. Don't try to fix it, you're just wasting your time. Just whack that thing, get it out of there, hang it up to dry. So now we'll get into a little bit about harvesting. Well, let's do a little bit about cleaning out still. So what we do is uh, right about now, we've got our legs showing pretty well. And I'd like to leave it, so the plant's about four feet tall. I like to have about this much breathing room at the bottom. I kind of skin everything up pretty well until there's like a good crown here. So you've got like four sets of uh, stems coming out of the main, main stock, the main cola, and, and all that from the bottom down needs to go. Especially this time of year, if you have extra time, you really need to be stripping your plants down. Because it's going to get moldy and it's going to get wet and you got to keep it under cover. You really need to keep all your stuff under greenhouses or under some type of tarp with fans on it. It's really key, especially this time of year. We're not having the Indian summer that we had last year. Um, I really feel sorry for all the growers who moved into the state and said, oh, 2015, this is the way Washington is. Well, I'm sorry to say, this is the way Washington is. So uh, it's unpredictable. We've got you know, early freezes here down in Vancouver as early as the first week in September before, and it started at the second and third week and rained all the way through December. You know, this is the way the weather is down here. Uh, the plants will finish as best they can. As the weather gets cooler and damper, they're going to try like heck to make seed. So they'll finish as much as they can, 
and take them as long as you can until you know you start seeing any kind of blight or any kind of butter. I like they can't say it enough. As soon as you see one spot, you've got to cut that thing down instantly, or you're going to lose all that time. Just think, you put all that effort in all the way from May, all the way through October, and you know you don't act on it. See what agriculture is all about is. To really be a, good, a farmer, you need to be on your property all the time and you need to be able to live with uh, the seasons and the changes and the way everything goes. Because at a drop of a dime in any agricultural business, you got to change what you're doing, flip to another mode, take, do it until it's done. You know, we've grown up to 90 plants before on our farm in our two greenhouses and, and that's a race. You know, this year they cut us way down and I'm just growing four. So. This year has really been more relaxation and enjoyable for me. I've really been able to get in there and grow some, you know, grow some exceptionally beautiful cannabis this year because I've been able to spend so much time and energy and love. So, uh, so once the thing goes, we'd like to keep them in as big a piece as possible, like you know, four big branches coming out from the main stock, and we try to lop them off in big chunks. And then we hang them up. And the first thing we do is we do a, a couple processes. First thing we do want to do is we want to get it in the house. And we want it to get in dark and we want it to hang it up. So the first thing we do is big leaf. So we go around and we'll sit there and we'll big leaf. All the big leaves off the main stock. Anything that's touching, to the, touch, touching the main stock, any leaf that's coming out of there is coming out right away. Then we bring it in the house and then within the next three days, we uh, start to uh, prepare for, what we do is with all those leaves, like we, we, we harvested Obama, some Obama kush the other day, last night actually. And uh, man, the, even on the big families, the trichomes were all the way up the bottom side of the families. So what we did is we collected all those, we put them in brown paper bags, and we put them in the freezer right away, because we're going to make an uh, ice ash out of them. So we make ice hash out of everything, you know, and when medical changes up here, they kind of pushed us into, into rosin because we couldn't do blow BHO anymore because it was regulated, but that's what we push for. We, you know, we, we kind of fought to get, have the concentrates legal in the state, you know, because the kids were blowing themselves out. That's why we pushed the legislature into it so hard. But, but now, being medical and not being regulated, I, I think they kicked the game up. I really prefer rosin over to over uh, a lot of the BHO. Way more flavorful, way more better product. You know, and it's funny, we've been taking pounds, making ice ash, turn it into a chunk like this, and they end up like six grams of <laughs> rosin. So everybody goes, what? Wow. You know, but it's the best of the best, you know? So I can take my six ounces right away, right off the top. I can put it in there, I can turn it into hash, and I can have uh, um, rosin. Now, if you haven't known 5052, John Novak told me this the other weekend, there's no limit on the concentrates for medical out there in the new law. There's no limit for it. So my theory is, well, it's all in the language, you know? You pay damn good money for that language out there. You know, they paid a, a lot of money, so all of us would be able to grow cannabis, you know what I mean? A lot of money passed hands, so all of us would be out of the game. You know, they, they, they see us as the big threat. You know, I see Oregon as more of a threat than us. You know what I mean? All the weed they're growing down there, unbelievable. I went down to Durham Road a couple, about three weeks ago. Two mile dirt road. Every Christian, redneck, senior citizen, everybody. Not only did they have three plants, most of them had ten plants, and all in hundred gallon pots. You know, if they're worried about the black market, they're going to be able to, the black market for Washington is what they should be worried about them being able to go into the rec stores in Oregon and purchasing it. Because the price difference is so, is, so, is so dramatic down there, you know. It's a lot less, you can get 20 grams of really good oil all day long, it's, everything's really cheap. So, as I digress back into, so we keep the, water, the, the big shade leaves, put them in the freezer, we're going to run them in a couple days. And then the next process, we like to take everything that's attached to a stem off. All the level leaves, everything. So within the first three days, we go through and we cut off all of those leaves that are attached to the stem. And then we, we cut them off in about 18-inch colas. Our colas are about this big. 
We'll cut them off into 18 inches. We'll keep that as bud and hang that up as bud. And the rest of it will be stripped off the stalks uh, and fresh frozen for more ice ash. So we only want to keep the colas for smoking and the rest of it is we, and it's way better than drying it out, believe me. Clip, clip, clip into a brown paper bag, put some masking tape on it, throw it in the freezer, and you're done? I mean, how easy is that? Instead of drying it and, you know, all these different things, but then to make hash out of it. it for me, it doesn't make sense. I'm all about fresh frozen. Let's do it as efficiently as possible. You know, there's a bunch of different ways to do this, and uh, this is just the way I'm doing it. So we take all of those buds out there, we keep the big buds, and what we'll do is we'll leave them out there until the stem the stem snaps pretty easily, one of the stems off the cola. And then we'll, what we'll do from there is we'll buck them down a little bit more and then put them into, um, we like to use brown paper bags, grocery bags for like everything. You know, I mean, they're they're really great part of the curing process and they're a really great part of, you know, keeping your cannabis. If you, like in years, we've, in the years before we had a lot of cannabis like laying around, we grew so much. And uh, we actually stored a lot of our, our buds in brown paper bags. Amazing how long uh, it, the, 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 the brown paper kind of regulates the moisture inside. It actually keeps them in pretty good shape, you know, surprisingly. So, I mean, if you, if you have a lot and you have a lot to process, that's one way to do it, you know. And then pull it out every, every week or so and, you know, make sure it breathes a little bit and wrap it back up. And, and that's not, a, that's not a bad way to do it. It all depends how much time you got in to put into it. So after we put it in the brown paper bag, we, we cure it up so it, the main stock snaps and it's ready to go. From that point on, we either put them into buddy bags, which are like a turkey bag, and then we actually use uh, cellophane bags. We've used them on the farm for years. My wife likes the cellophane, so and I don't argue with her. So uh, it works. They work pretty good. We use big cellophane bags. It's a wood product, and uh, and uh, we keep them in there. So we'll burp them in there, and you know leave the bag open, you know, so it'll air out like every every you know like every three days. To start off, when you're doing the burping process, whether you go into jars or whatever. The jar process actually is the best process. If you have the time and you have the jars and you've got the patience to do it, then the jar technique is probably the best technique. You know, so after, after it comes out of the brown paper bag, we'll buck it down a little bit more. We'll put it into jars. And you want to try to pack the jars as much as possible. You don't want to leave a lot of air in the jar. I mean, uh, that's, you know, there's, there's, once you have air in there, you know, the uh, oxidation process starts. So you want to have as little air in any of the stuff you have. It's probably the best way to, to do it. But you also want to be able to take it out and move it around. So it's a, it's a juggling act. Uh, as far as uh, the curing process goes, we'll, we'll like jar it all up and then we'll just start, we'll do, we'll burp every day for a day or two. And then we'll burp every two days and then we'll burp every four days and we'll just keep going out until we like to do a 16 day uh, cure is, a pro is probably the best cure out there. Um, when we did the markets all the time, that was kind of the gold standard for curing. You, you seem to be able to get it dry enough and get it tasting good enough and get it ready to the market and, and it still holds all its flavor and taste and aromas and stuff. So that's the, that's the time period that we look for for the, for the cure. So, and I haven't, I've been given some of those big, those big tins, you know, that, that do the uh, curing in them, but I haven't tried them yet. I think I'm going to try them this year, and somebody gave one, a couple to me at the show, and I think I'll give them a try, but I really like to cure, I really like to make sure whenever I'm packing anything that there's, that there's a little air in there as possible. Because with air, you're going to get oxidation. So, and another thing, we like to keep all of our stuff in a cool, dark room. So we have a special room in the house where, and it's actually inside one of our, our sauna. So we keep it all in this wood sauna that we have, and we pack it all in there, and that's kind of where we kept it over the years. It's in the middle of the house. It, 
it's dark and it's cool and um, seem they, everybody it, it seems to if I when I crop like I crop last year and my stuff is still tasting pretty good but right now it's kind of on the downslide and then now this crop is coming in and we're getting fresh and you know and then what we do is we take that the stuff we didn't use from the last year we'll throw it in the freezer and make uh, ice hash and bubble hash on it we've been big uh, proponents of uh, live resin back in the day we were actually a couple months ago when we were cleaning up before 5052 kicked into place Paul was saying yeah there's still some bags of from 20 uh, 2013 in there you know fresh frozen and I'm all, well, I'll be dipped. Wow. Come on, Dwayne, let's put that through the machine. So we packed it all up in the machine, and we got fire out of it. You know, but freezing those terpenes, uh, to get the best flavors and tastes, you got to you gotta fresh, fresh freeze that stuff as soon as possible because every hour, those terpenes are disappearing and disappearing and disappearing and disappearing. So if you want to have the most flavorful oils, passes, whatever, you know, fresh frozen is always the way to go. We really <coughs> like the process over the years. Curious, what what kind of concentrates can you or can you not do with fresh frozen? Is there any that you can't do with fresh frozen? I, I'm not too sure about CO2 because I've never really, I'm not a big fan, first of all, of CO2, but I've never really dabbled in it that much. I'm more of ice hash than BHO, and BHO really works really well because you're capturing all those turkey stuff and, and they're in a frozen state and basically when you're when we were blowing BHO either through the closed loop or everything we froze everything we free the BH we freeze the BHO we freeze the weed we freeze the steel columns with the you know with the weed inside I mean everything was ice cold as possible when we were making concentrates we always thought the best the best place to do concentrates would be like a super air conditioned uh, uh, like a paint boost setup for these paint guys because all the air comes out the bottom and they're sucking the air out. We always thought that would be a really super safe place to do it and a really great way to do it because the colder you can get it and the drier you can get it, the better product you can get. Do you recommend that also for tinctures and edibles? Yes. Yeah, 100%. Because you're just ripping, all you're doing is ripping the trichomes off. Well, that too. Another thing, Tom, is that uh, when, when you do comps or tinctures, Freeze the alcohol, freeze the Everclear, freeze the cannabis because you freeze the water crystals mm -hmm. and nothing you want is water soluble, everything you want is alcohol soluble, alcohol doesn't freeze. So definitely help at 165 a pound at Fred Meyer buy dry ice and freeze the cannabis in a you know, styrofoam cooler for an hour with the Everclear and you get a much different product. It'll be golden because you won't get the chlorophyll coming out and when you do shake it, it can be 30 seconds to 3 minutes with frozen Everclear, when it goes golden to green, stop. So yeah, I'm a big freezer. Yeah, big freezer is always big. No, that'd be come out right. <laughs> yeah, well, when the, ter when the terpenes came out, we really started digging in. I mean, it was probably like three or four years ago at the markets, and uh, all of a sudden terpenes were the big thing, you know, and how could we capture them, and how could we get the tastiest oil, and what do we need to do, and what were all the, the, all the tricks, you know, and everybody had their trick, you know, like uh, the, you know, the, the way they bath it out, you know, you know, it's like conductive, non-conductive, conductive, non conductive see all these layers of glass and metal all filled with water, you know, to get that perfect temperature so you can capture those perfect terpenes all in the process, so it got all geeky there for a while, but, you know, we had some fire oil, you know, what that, what that led us. But now all they did was make a step our game up, so I really love the whole rosin and ice hash, the ice hash deal, and, you know, it, and, and, like, it's a race to the bottom, there's tons of weed out there, so I think it's going to be the future, because, you know, I mean, at 37 cents a gram to a dollar fifty or whatever it is, and then everybody said it's going to go down like in Oregon. When it, I don't, I don't remember what they're expecting, but Oregon's going to be a mess, man. That's that. There's so much marijuana down there. You guys have no <laughs> <laughs> like. As far as your eye can see, many places huge, and they have no plant count down there. It's like, it's 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 huge. We're going to walk uh, up. But anyways, it's going to be good for the customer. <laughs> 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 if they can keep the quality up, 
that, that's the whole deal, you know. What are they going to do to save their crop? That's the big deal, you know. So uh, knowing your farmer and knowing where your product comes from is a huge deal. And that's why we all here, we love to grow our own because, you know, we've always believed, believed Paul and I, that uh, when, we had our, uh, when we were doing our collective garden, we always had pieces of every, something special for every one of our patients in our garden because we, we believe that their energy needed to be in the, in the greenhouses with the plants because we thought that the plants are so intuitive. They, because everybody grows, I grow my own best wheat. Everybody in here grows the best wheat for themselves. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 Right? Yeah. Right. So the plants intuitive, it really it has an idea of what you need and what you're looking for. And uh, I believe everybody does grow the, the, the best plants for themselves, for sure, 100%. Um, yes. Would you explain the hash process? Um, the ice hash process? Okay, sure. So what we do is we fresh freeze everything. We put it in brown paper bags, and the brown paper bags, <coughs> even in the freezer, seems to pull a little bit of the, the moisture out of them. So what we do is we'll take that and we'll uh, I use a um, a washing machine and and bubble bags. So I have a work bag. That's a zipper bag. It's kind of like uh, the, uh, the delicate laundry bag, you know, for like the, the satins and all those things. It's basically that. And it's about as big as this. And what we do is we like to layer it. We'll put ice on the bottom, and then we'll, like if we're working with the whatever product we are, buds or whatever, we'll put a layer of those in, and we'll just layer it all the way to the top. So I have this big, huge zipped block. Is this dry ice? No, it's just regular ice. It's cheap. And then what we do is we take it and we put it in the washing machine and then, and then we run it at uh, 15 minute cycles, two, two cycles, and then we dump it into uh, a set of bubble bags which are like different meshes. So it goes from like 160 to 72 to 40 to 20 to 25. And 25 is your full melt ice ash, you know, it can be dabbed and stuff. And then uh, uh, the 40 is like your money bag. That's where you're going to get all your good trichomes and your terpenes are going to hang out there. And then uh, the rest of the stuff is kind of, you know, it, it's questionable. Those are, the two, <laughs> <laughs> those are the two bags we like to work with. Those two bags. And then what we'll do is uh, we'll run it through the we'll run it through the bags and I'll run them four times. So I'll keep that bag in there until all the ice is melted out of that thing. And, it, and it's, it's just cannabis in there. And then what you can take, what you can do with that byproduct is it's all fully usable. We'll take that product and put it out in a, a like a dryer, like a dehydrator, and layer it up and dry it out, and then powderize. You got can of caps, already ready to go. So we we try to use as many of these products as possible, you know, as we're doing it. So the, the back to the hash deal. Then we got them in our bubble bags. We lift them out and then we put them over a five gallon bucket and then we get a little water squirt bottle and we start to squirt all the bubble, bubbles out so you end up with just the product. And then we take it and we wring it out really good and squeeze it. We try to get as much of the water out as we can. And then it goes into our freezer where we have all these little packets of chunks of hash. And then what we do is we, uh, we microplane it, uh, zesting it. So we'll take pizza trays and, a, and like a lemon zester and you got this big block of hash that's frozen and we'll go like this and just powder it out all over the pizza tray, the whole pizza tray and then we'll put it in the cool dark room you know and let it dry, it takes about a week to dry and then what we'll do is we'll scrape all of that stuff up and then we'll uh, put it into little uh, 25 micron bags, um, silk, uh, silk bags and then we'll put it, then we'll squish it with heat and pressure. We have a little, uh, somebody gave me some little, you know, little squisher. <laughs> so, we, you know, we just, we just squish it. So basically, we, but I, I, I just love it. We take a pound, and then we end up with like an ounce or so, and then we take a bat and we end up with like six or seven grams. So basically, we take a pound of weed and we end up with six or seven grams. And it is fire. We love it. You know, it's like kind of our favorite thing. And it's kind of a no, it's kind of a novelty thing too. You know. Go so, ahead. so Tom, I know that you only uh, uh, keep the top 18 inches of the cola for yourself to smoke, you know, in joints or whatever. Yeah. 
Um, for folks in the room who are not going to make a uh, hash out of it, will you go through your, your drawing process a little oh, bit? Oh, sure. Because, you know, um, last year when we had a similar talk, it was more commercial oriented. Yeah. And it was very focused on mandatory um, humidity settings, but like most of us are just doing it in our house, you know? Yeah. So, well, we so did, what's it like real DIY uh, curing? Or, uh, what drawing? we do is we, we bring up, uh, <laughs> we have one of those big humidifiers, big humidifiers, we bring it into the living room, kind of everything that's done in our, in our living room or our little storage shed out there. And uh, we bring it in and we hang everything and we have a, a little rotating fan that keeps everything moving. And uh, we do that, yeah, we do, we, we cure it off like that. And then from there, like I said, we'll hang it up there until it, until it snaps, until it's dry, and then we'll buck it down and put it into jars and start burping it for the 17 days. That's kind of, that's kind of key. And um, the buds that are up there, you can trim off as, as much as you want. I'm kind of partial to uh, NorCal, uh, North Pacific Northwest rough cut, you know? Yeah. I kind of like the leaves a little bit on it and stuff. Yeah. They don't really bother me. I'm not like, you know, like those Southern Oregon guys and those Humboldt guys and, you know, everything has to be like, you know, and I don't know. It really doesn't do a lot. And I, you know, we'll smoke their, their joints and we'll smoke my joints and people, oh, we really like your weed. So, you know, I don't know. So I think there's a lot of love. I think there's a lot of love that goes into it that it comes out with the end product. Sure. I wonder about the foliar feed. Um, first, you do it pre-flower. Yeah, we're heavy foliar feeders. Sure. So I'm a, I use fish. I use fish, and I use a, a, a compost tea. Uh, Mother Earth Organics makes uh, liquid feedback, and it's really good. It's a humic acid base, and it's pretty much an activator. I like to use it with all my different things, but three times a week I spray, Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays at, at 3 o'clock at hottest part of the day. And we just go in there, and we, we bought an a actual a one that hooked onto my little mower, a little pump sprayer. We just go in there, and up underneath the leaves, the whole inside, just Get them drenched and that, then watch them just blow up. Is that uh, hydrolyzed fish? Yeah, it's just stuff. I don't know. We buy it at the Fred Meyer, you know, down the street. You know, the fish emulsion. Yeah, the fish emulsion. You know, <laughs> I mean, we just do the stuff we've been doing for years. You know, <laughs> I try not to get too high tech. I try to, you know, the kiss the kiss method is pretty much it. Let's keep it simple. All this crazy stuff. You know, I don't see a lot of super benefits to it. All those, those microbes that you see on the table here, those things are bomb. I'm a big, huge micro fan. I mean, we micro this the heck out of everything, and then we molasses a lot. We'll start molasses, and we'll molasses. You know, we stopped molassing about two weeks ago, but we molasses heavy, 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 and it's microbes and molasses, and then it's, you know, we rotate the back guanos and the sea guanos, you know, right, right up to the end, you know. Uh. For your purposes, you're talking about using compost tea as a foliar. Yeah. Uh, would worm tea do the same thing, or does it, I mean, is it specific to like when you compost the plant material in that way? Well, it could be, a, or, I think worm tea could work pretty good too, mm -hmm. you know, and then uh, these, uh, you wouldn't want to make it too nitrogen rich, you know? Right, right. But uh, it's the fastest way to get the, the you know, the nitrogen to the leaves is, is like right up under it. You know, during the heat of the day, you know, all the stamos or everything's yeah. wide open, man, and they just drink. And you don't the top, just go well, I just go up underneath, because that's where they're that's where they feed from. They don't feed it from the top. Everybody they all, all the plants feed from the bottom. So when we from tomatoes to everything, we always we always go up. And do you use molasses in your foliage spray also? No, no, no. We just use fish and tea. You know, we don't, we don't. I don't like to put sugars on my leaves. You know, I, the sugars go in the soil where the microbes are, and then the microbes, you know, they, they start doing what beer does. You know, they start, you know, burping and all that fun stuff, and you know, makes all that stuff more bioavailable. Do you recommend you do a uh, flush at the end uh, to flush out the nutrients and everything? Well, I mean, outdoors a little bit different than in, than in pots and stuff like that. I mean, my pot, my holes are like. This big, you know. So um, we just 
we'll just stop at the we'll just stop like two weeks. We stopped like two weeks ago, and maybe I'll do one big watering at the end, but that's about it. Because at the end, at this time of year, you want to cut back on your watering because you really want to force them to finish as quick as possible. Like this year is super short. So you want to force them. So what we do is we'll quit watering them, you know what I mean? And and they'll finish up quicker. You know, and then especially since in the ground, if we have a lot of rain, you know, we'll start getting groundwater in there too. So and we and so I, I like to force them at the end and push them a little bit to finish quicker because it's always a road race out here for us. You know, we never really get to ideally finish, but they do a really good job here, you know. I mean they do a good enough job because of the uh, fluctuations in the weather and the temperature and stuff. I, and I also think that's why outdoor and greenhouse cannabis, uh, it tastes so good and it, and it works so good because it's out there in the, in the nature, you know. It gets all of those wind changes. It's not a sterile on and off and on and off, you know. Every day is a little different. You've got clouds in the morning someday. Oh, some days it's sunny, so, you know, so it, there's a big variance. Mm -hmm. And I think the plants, the plants really respond to it. We're all about full spectrum everything. Full spectrum soil, full spectrum sun. We want it all. So I don't really like to isolate those things. And, you know, so sure you can get really pretty buds, but, you know, how do they look? How do they feel? Yeah. Yes, Allison? Um, uh, 16 day cure that you mentioned. Uh -huh. Is that, do you start like basically from the time you take the plant down or after you snap? Uh, oh, well, after I snap. Yeah, it's after it's totally dry. 16 days after that, it's it's ready to go. But it's off. When you say it's, you mean take it off the stem and put it in jars, or is it? Still yeah, we buck them off or shuck them or whatever off the stems and put it into jars. Right. Yeah. Have you started harvesting anything yet? Oh yeah, yeah. All day yesterday, I played golf, a cannabis golf tournament on Monday, and then I got home yesterday. And I got up yesterday morning and I saw that one leaf go like this on my beautiful uh, Obama Kush. And so I said, honey, <laughs> get ready. Here comes the flood. You know, so, so she gets everything ready. And what we do is we set up our whole living room. She categorizes everything. We put everything on hangers. She puts a little piece of the tape on it where she marks everything. We mark the day that we pulled it. And we mark the strain that it's on. And then um, that's how we kind of keep track of them. Those blue, that blue tape goes on to the brown paper bags, and we also like to write everything on the bags so we can keep track of everything. So when you um, start harvesting, you just cut the branches off your plant and hang them upside down? Yeah, I, I do a lot of topping when they're small, so I got like, you know, you know, four big crowns coming off each one, and I'll like tape those off right. and then hang them. My, my wife does, I mean, that's all she does, you know. She hers is amnesia haze, and what she all, all she likes me to do is go to Home Depot and get the big, huge leaf bags, you know. And then she just takes the whole thing and stuffs it in there. And all she does is break it off throughout the year, and it is. I mean, still to this day, I'm like, can I have some of your amnesia haze? <laughs> Um, well, over the years, you've uh, you've expanded your grow. Uh, you've had a lot of different types of uh, operations. You've tried a lot of different methods. Now, with the reduced numbers, what is your preferred method for the most amount of harvest per plant? The most amount of harvest per plant by preferred method. Well, well, just big, huge holes. Because the bigger the hole, the bigger the plant. So we go jumbo holes. And when you're using a clone, all those all those roots are going to go laterally out to the edge of pretty much where your canopy is. So you want to make sure. I'm not a big fan of super deep soil and wasting a lot of soil. Literally, I take the shovel about eight ten inches in, pop it out, we clean it out, and and that's it. I don't dig big huge pits, and I don't use three feet of soil, and I don't do anything crazy. I just We've always gone kind of minimal, and our, our plants always look pretty good from what everybody says. Yes? So, um, can you get more specific about how to tell when the plant can start harvesting? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm not here. I'm here. It's a, there, there's a couple different ways. Whoops. 
So up here, I got the white lights here. So up here, it's a, up here it's a race. You know, once you have once you have powdery and once you have light, then it's time to pull them down. But if you don't have either, if you don't have either of those, I would just wait till your colas are nice and bud. If they're indicas, they're gonna you know the if you want to take the microscope out and look at them and. You know, like if fifty percent of the trichromes are amber, that's like ideal. You know, and uh, or lighter's a little bit better. You know, the lighter they are, the, the more up high it is. You know, the more clear they are, the more up high it is. So it all depends what you know, kind of what you're looking for. The deeper the amber, so you can take a really sativa and and cook it to the end so it's all nice and amber. Well, that stuff will put you out. You know what I mean? It's all, it's all, a lot of it's in the trichomes and how, how far you take that plant. Yes? We have rain forecast on Saturday. It looks like it's going to, all next week off and on. I mean, isn't that the signal you better get after? Yeah. Oh, yeah. For sure. Especially if you're, especially if you're not in greenhouses. Definitely. I would be on it as soon as you possibly can. Yeah. Well, like, like ideally, ideally, if you only have a couple of plants, like uh, we only we only have a few plants, so I've been getting up at like four o'clock in the morning when it's ideal to plant it, because then the plants asleep, and that's the, actually the time when they're growing the most. So I get up early in the morning and I get out there and I will love take the plants down, and then I'll hang them, and then I'll uh, I'll go back to bed, you know, and then uh, and, and that's the way I kind of like to do it. You know? Get it when you can. And then I keep it in a, we keep it in a dark room for three days, and during the three days we pull them out. And then, like I said, we, we just cut uh, any of the smaller leaves that are attached to a stem. And then we just get them. So we keep the big leaves separated from that stuff, too. So uh, anything, any of those small leaves that are attached to a stem, they go. And anything below the cola that we want, that'll go into making hash brush. And if you want to do other things with it, you can. If you want to dry it, then, I don't know, do whatever you could. If you're looking for more CBDs, do you harvest early or late? Early. Early. 100%. Time of day, remember? Yeah, like at, uh, early at like three, 3 to 4 in the morning, kind of at the end of their night cycle. And then I'll bring them in the house and put them in a dark room. And then we'll start to work them for those next three days, and then we'll hang them to dry with like a light fan on them, just barely keep them moving. You don't want to put a hard fan on them. You don't want to quick dry them, but you just want to make sure the Pacific Northwest that you got some movement because you don't want any mold or you know anything that may already be on the leaves. Any mold spores that may be on the leaves to start to pack the paper. Right. Hang it up. Yeah. As far as how many days did you recommend hanging up the colas? Oh, to hang up the colas, you're going to probably hang them up before you put them in the brown paper bags about five days. It all depends on the humidity, too. And uh, those humidity things, 55 is about the best humidity. For what? For spraying. You like you hook up a sprayer. Yeah, to our little uh, little tractor, they have a pump sprayers, and you can get them from Northwest Freight or something like that. It's a farm supply store. If you put them in there, and it hooks up to the batteries on your on your little mower, and uh, there's a little pump on there, and it pumps it out. So you, for years we did backpack sprayers, and boy, man, those are work out on your back and everything. And this year I said, okay. Got a couple hundred extra bucks. Yeah, let's get it. So we got it. It makes a world of difference because you just sit there and it's got pretty good power and it puts out a nice spray. Ideally for that, what you want is you want a, a, a fogger. So they have like these still foggers that are for, for uh, applying fertilizers and what any kind of thing you want to apply, apply for. <coughs> You can get in there and fog the whole plant, and that if you're really doing, that's the ideal way because you get coverage, full, 100 percent coverage, and almost. It's not too fine. You know, you no, know, it's, it's a big fine. mist. You know, you probably want to wear a mask when you do it because you'll be breathing it in. But, but besides that, it works really good. You know. Oh, and another way at this time of year, if you get rain, you can shake your plants, but works really good as a leaf blower. Mm -hmm. 
take a leaf blower like your drive in blower and go up to your plants and just go, you know, this guy, and it really gets the water up. So leaf blowers work. If you're in a pinch, you, you've got a job, and you come home and it just rained, and you want to save your plant, get your leaf blower out. You know, and just blow that thing, you know, because right now, where we're living, we're starting to see bud rot, and people are pulling their plants because of the rain we had last weekend. You know, everybody's buds were this big already, and sure, they went out and shook them, but there's too much moisture in there. There's little pockets in there that are starting to pop out, and, you know, and you don't have problems, and that stuff goes quick. You know, if you see any problems, I can't stress enough. As soon as you see that problem, take that thing down like instantly. One spot on your plant. You see, my rule is one leaf limps over and the whole plant is down. Because it can take 7% of your plant a day once that stuff gets cooking. And you don't even know if you got it the first day, if you saw it the first day or not. So it's a for me it's a race, you know, and I didn't work, you know, like in years before we would start in like February. I didn't work like nine months to get to the end and then have it, you know, turn to shit, you know. <laughs> Excuse me. But anyways. Yeah. So we were talking about, um, so you hang it for five days, you said 50% humidity is ideal. Is that 50% humidity in the bud or 50% humidity in the room? In the room. Okay, great. That's the drying. Awesome. Yeah, so like uh, like 10 or 12 percent is, is is better in the bud. So they have some of these bud humidity humidity testers where you put it up against the bud and it can get you. 13 is a little high. I think you know 10 to 12 is probably a little bit more realistic. Thank you. Okay. You get a spider mite infestation in the harvest. What happens? I mean, what what should you do if you get a spider mite infestation? Really. <laughs> I mean, people have, you know, in, in, in the past and stuff like that, it was, all, oh, yeah, we'll just turn it into oil, you know what I mean? So, but, I don't you know, growing outdoors and growing in greenhouses is really so forgiving that you should really never have any spider mite problems at all. And it's too, they like super dry, hot arid, you know, and we have all this moist and every morning there's dew everywhere and there's just too much moisture and there's really no reason unless unless somebody brought the buds in or they brought the rusted mites in, then you're not you shouldn't have any problems. So and we've been really open with our farm and, and thank goodness, you know, we really haven't had any problems. The only problems we did have was a few years ago we brought some plants in from California. And they had rust, rusted mites, but it was also a year I was doing 90 plants. And, uh, and I thought we had all the rusted mites taken care of way earlier. We didn't really have a problem. But then I saw this weird truck drive up and down the street with a county vehicle. It had this weird box on the back. And I think there may be some sort of, they may, they may be spreading, you know, spreading rusted mites intentionally to damage the crops. Rusted mites first turned up in California in probably uh, 2010 when uh, some friends of mine in the Cottonwood area said the helicopters flew over and within four days they dropped rusted mites and knocked out the whole valley. You know? So, you know, these things can happen. <laughs> Oh yeah, okay. So there's 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 a couple things else you don't want in your garden. You don't want the little yellow yellow looking like lady beetles. They're not lady beetles, the little yellow ones. And then you don't want the white butterflies that go around, you know, they're kissing all the time and they want to land on your plant. Well every time they land on your bud, they're laying an egg and you're gonna get bud rot in there. So you want to <laughs> I, this time of year, they're like my mortal enemy. I ran around with our swine fathers, and I was like, ah! <laughs> You see, if I chase them around, it's like, ah! You know, because what a bummer is you have this big, beautiful cola, and all of a sudden you crack it up, crack it open, and you see this worm in there that's dead. It got you baked, and it's just like dead in there, and your whole bed is ruined. It's like, ah, That's no good. 
So those are a couple things to watch out for. The really, they look cute, but they're really messy. <laughs> Okay. Uh, you said you separate out the leaves into two, you know, the large leaves and the little ones. And then, are you processing them in any particular way, or? Yeah, we make ice ash out of them. Both. Out of both of them. Yeah. We make ice ash out of everything. We, it's it's quick. It's easy. It's inexpensive. We're not using any hydrocarbons. We're not using anything dangerous. And there's really not anything they can say about it you know, any of the authorities, and it's a better, cleaner process. I mean, all you're using is ice cold water, ice and ice cold water, and heat and pressure. I mean, that's like the four elements or something like that, right? You know? <laughs> got it all going on. You got the action, you know, the heat, the pressure, the cold, the water. I don't understand why you did the, the thin slices of the hash to dry it out. What, what's, what does that do? And then you put the press back together again. No, no, no. We, we microplane, we squeeze all the water out, and then we put it in the freezer. Uh -huh. And then that way it stores really well. So when we're ready to use it, we microplane it out so it's fluffy, because we know there's still moisture in there. Uh -huh. And now we've tried to squeeze it, like straight out of the freezer. We take a chunk off and we go, wow, it may not have that much moisture on it. But what happens with the heat and pressure, it starts boiling in there, the water does, and it blows out the side of the bag and you got hash mixed in with your with your with your rosin so and that's no good. Yes. Not ideal, but if you needed to pause during the drying process, because you weren't going to be able to take care of it all at one time, is there an option to kind of like dry it for five days, stick it in the freezer and then finish no, 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 or anything? I would never put any any cannabis products you ever want to smoke in the no, 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 no. The best thing you could do is put them in a, keep them in a full plant, get those big, huge bags from uh, uh, Home Depot, those big, you know, the big paper bag, those long leaf bags, put it in there, that'll keep it regulated. Just slow it down. It'll slow it down, it'll regulate it too, and you won't lose it. Okay. So, so you don't want to put, don't ever put anything in any plastic. Never. Not even in the freezer. You know, we're all about paper and stuff like that because it breathes and it kind of regulates itself. It makes it not so, um, you know, sensitive. Because you, in those plastic bags, you build up that moisture, that mold starts happening and it's a mess. Okay. You went out of questions. Woo! 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 You want to talk a little bit about preserving? Yeah. About preserving? Yeah. 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 yeah, I think the jars work the best. Yeah. 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 If you got the patience and the time and you're going to have it around for a while, yeah. the jars work the best. And then after it's really cured in the jars, pack them as much as you can. Okay. And then if you can suck the air out of them, you know, they have some of those vacuum sealers that do, do the jar lids too. Okay. Suck it out, but you, you really want to get as much in there as possible. Oh, okay. I mean, not over stuffed, you know what I mean, but you know, nice and snug. After you finish the 16 days. Yeah, after you finish the 16 days. Yeah, uh -huh. and then I check them. Oh, probably like every 15 to 30 days after that, you know, just want to give it a little sniff, you know. And if you smell anything that's a little off, then it's time to get a little drier. Okay, and then uh, keeping that in the dark. Dark, cold, dark, cool area. I feel mean, just like any kind of. You know, root stores would be ideal. You know, okay. Nice root stores facility. Yes. Do you have problems with aphids? Uh, no, not really. We use trap plants at our farm. So what we do is we use uh, 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 plants that the bugs really like. So like in the bug world, uh, green beans, it's like filet mignon, you know, and then eggplants like bacon. <laughs> so between between filet mignon and bacon, you know, these bugs are stoked. They'll go after the green beans and they'll go after the eggplants before they'll go after your cannabis plant all day long. And eggplants are super effective because you go to anybody's garden and you look at the eggplant and 
eggplant's always been hit hard. It's a delicacy to them. So what we do is instead of, so we do a lot of trap plants and stuff like that, and companion plant. And they, it'll mince work pretty well too, and you know, so we've been incorporating that in our stuff for kind of a while. And we, and we separate our garden from our cannabis garden by a long distance because the bugs like the, and the squash, moss, and they like to hang out in the vegetable garden. So we give them everything they can possibly need, and then they, then they leave our garden alone. So it's kind of separated. Yes? So the jar that you know, that's what you're selling? What? So the gel in the jar that you know. No, I'm not a big fan of that stuff. I mean, I really haven't tested it that much. There's a bunch of new products on the market. Um, maybe I'll give it. I'll give it a test drive this year. But I've had pretty successful luck, you know. And generally, like it, when my cannabis isn't tasting so good, my next crop comes in. So, you know, it's kind of a wash, and then we can make whatever we want out of the, what's what's left over. So, if you're doing a small, you know, uh, grow medical grow or whatever your four plants or whatever your lab, you know, that's that's the way I would do it. You know, I would, st I would start them and I would try to get them as big and as low as you possibly can in line. You know, and uh, so there's some, if you read the laws, there's some interesting, you know, there's some, there's some interesting things you could probably be doing. Cool. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. All right.